Hello, all. Welcome this afternoon to another CWP event. Um, today's topic will be discussing a new book, Putin's Turn to the East in the Xi Jinping Era, with uh, authors Gilbert Rossman, um, Gail Christopherson, and James J.D. DJ Brown, who actually came in from Japan. Um, while most attention is focused on Putin's aggression in Ukraine, the big story of the past decade has been the reorientation of Russia from Europe to Asia. Centered on China, but not limited to it, this abrupt, shi this abrupt shift made possible Putin's anti-West behavior. In the book, Turn to the East, Rosman and Christofferson and several contributors present an analysis with the overall message combines two contrasting conclusions. Russia has increasingly joined with China in challenging the existing order in Asia, working to forge what Moscow calls a greater Eurasian partnership. And Russia and China have played a cat and mouse game of rival strategies that on all fronts have been difficult to reconcile. Without grasping this story, it would be difficult to understand why Putin has invaded Ukraine and is threatening the West. My name is Daniel Sahansky. I'm the Deputy Director of the China and the World Program. Um, and our three speakers today, Professor Rosman has taught at Princeton from 1970 to 2013. Since that time, he has edited the Asian Forum, a bi-monthly online journal on international relations in the Indo-Pacific. He has also edited annual volumes on foreign relations in the region for Korean Economic Institute. His undergraduate major was Chinese and Russian studies, and has began Japanese studies as a graduate student at Princeton and Korean studies, too, during two stints as a visiting professor at Korean universities. He takes an inter interdisciplinary view of Northeast Asia, writing about national identities, geopolitics, and economic regionalism. Every two months, he writes an overview of Japanese and Russian articles on the Indo-Pacific, and sometimes he also writes the overview of Chinese articles. While he edits the overview of, Chi of Korean articles since 2021, he has authored or edited three books in addition to Putin's Turn to the East in the Xi Jinping era. Gail Christofferson has taught at Johns Hopkins University, Sais Nanjing, from 2012 to 2021, the Naval Postgraduate School, the University of Hawaii, in, and Eastern Mediterranean University. She was the first Fulbright Scholar of, uh, at Far Eastern Federal University in 1992, and was also a Fulbright Fellow Professor at Chinese Foreign Affairs University in 1998. She is the editor of Russia in the Indo-Pacific, New Approaches to Russians Foreign Policy 2022. She is an, on the editorial board member of the Chinese Journal of Slavic Studies and Comparative Politics, Russia, a journal of the Center of Comparative Chinese Studies and Regional Projects, Moscow State University of International Relations. Finally, but not least, James D.J. Brown is a professor of international affairs and political science at Temple University's Japan campus. His area of expertise include Russia-Japan relations, Russian foreign policy, and Japanese foreign policy, as well as producing academic articles and monographs. Dr. Brown regularly writes op-eds, including for Nikkei Asia, the Japan Times, and The Diplomat. He also writes in Russian and Japanese, including for the Carnegie Moscow Center and Nikkei Business. He is also frequently quoted in the media, including by the New York Times, the Financial Times, The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, Yomori Shimbun, and Hokkaido Shimbun and the BBC. Give a warm welcome to our panelists. Uh, okay. Thank you, Dan. I will start and uh, we will move down the line as we proceed, leaving lots of time for your feedback and questions. Uh, what makes this book special? Well, I think there are several things. One, it tells us what Russia was trying to do in East Asia before it decided to go to full-scale war in Ukraine. The two are connected. It could not have gone to war in Ukraine without understanding a different environment in East Asia. And what it has done in East Asia is really complex. It's not as if there's just been one soaring improvement in Sino-Russian relations. It has been uh, up and down. There have been lots of questions and there are many dimensions for understanding this relationship. And what we try to do in this book is work very much from Russian language sources and other sources of the region 
because they really give us a lot of insight. In fact, there's so much insight in the Russian sources that one chapter says, this is the mainstream Russian position. We follow it year by year, stage by stage over more than a decade. And the next chapter says, these are the questions that raise doubts about the mainstream position. And we follow those over that same period. And therefore we get a better understanding by being able to go in both directions. I wanna say that this book is not a standalone volume. We have a four volume series that we have in mind. This came out last year and right afterwards, a book co-authored uh, on South Korea's wild ride over the decade also came out. And shortly afterwards, we were making progress on the Japan book and that will be out in a few weeks. Japan's momentous decade, talking about how significant changes in Japan have been. And the China book is two thirds or more done. We post the chapters in the Asan forum online. And then when the book comes out, we take them off uh, and they're only available through book form. So if you're interested in the China side of things, I've been writing on Xi Jinping's policy towards Northeast Asia is thinking about Russia, Korea, Japan uh, over the period from 2013 uh, and through 2020. And in the summer, my final piece on the period 2021 to 2024 will appear. Um, so we cover a full decade. This is also a comprehensive look at Russian thinking toward Asia, as the other books tend to be comprehensive. We cover thinking in every direction. Central Asia, which Gaia will explain more detail, uh, the, the border area between Russia and China, Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, India. We try to make it comprehensive. We try to make it multifactorial, looking at geopolitics, uh, aspects of economic relations, some identity issues. Uh, and we, I think the, the theme that emerges most fully is what makes the Sino-Russian relationship stronger? How has it gotten to where it is? While also asking, what have been the hurdles? What are some of the problems? And those still exist today. So I will make a few comments about the four stages of our analysis. Uh, and then go briefly into the Sino-Russian relationship. Gaia will turn to emphasize Central Asia, and James will be talking about the Japan-Russia uh, relationship. So in the first stage of Putin's announced <clears throat> turn to the East, which is much more far-reaching than Obama's pivot to Asia or rebalance to Asia, this is a really big deal. Um, and it changes the view of Asia so much more than what Obama was, uh, and even Biden have been trying to do. So um, in the first phase, we see an emphasis on the Russian Far East, how it's going to be more modernized, uh, a, a Vladivostok APEC coming out summit, uh, a talk about uh, the multi-directional nature of this uh, turn, uh, the importance of working with Japan, South Korea, uh, and others. Uh, China was first, more important than anyone else, but still it was not so heavily China-oriented. And people with different points of view explored different approaches to what this turn could be in Russia. But the Crimean invasion, annexation, and the shift in the winter of 2014 <clears throat> changed the turn importantly. And now the focus was much more on opposing the United States, strengthening ties with China, uh, with not nearly as much regard for the others. But there was still important bilateral diplomacy continuing with Japan, as I think James can explain, and with South Korea. Uh, and so 
But the hope was that there would be a, a Sino-Russian kind of condominium. They would dock, as the term they use, the Russian agenda uh, and the Chinese agenda with economic infrastructure projects in Central Asia being a kind of overlapping link between the two. Uh, <clears throat> but that didn't work out very well. The Chinese weren't investing. They weren't interested in some of the projects that Russia was highlighting and they were running up against obstacles. So what was Russia gonna do next for its turn that wasn't going very well? They did have a new North Korea agenda, which is pretty important, uh, particularly as the background for what's happening lately. Uh, but what we then see is a effort uh, with China to redefine the whole architecture of, the, of Asia more continental, less maritime, more talk about a kind of Eurasian reconstruction. The Russians called it the Greater Eurasian Partnership, GEP. And the Chinese fought on to that, at least in language, but really the Belt and Road Initiative was going full glass. And Russia was hesitant to really join that event even though Putin was the honored guest at BRI summits, Russia didn't declare that it was really part of the BRI. Uh, and so what we see then is China developing a sinocentric overview of where Asia was going, but insisting with Russia that they were on the same wavelength. And Russia trying to figure out how it would stay close to China in these circumstances. Uh, because it didn't have very much else to proceed to go on. Uh, and then we get the point where <laughs> the Sino-Russian top-down alliance, semi-alliance really, is going pretty well. And there's even talk about forming an alliance on both sides. And then we see um, Russia also noticing that the asymmetry and China's behavior is not consistent with re what Russia wants in its GEP. China is moving ahead, getting more confident, and even arrogant towards Russia. Uh, Russia is feeling more marginalized. Uh, India is sort of the supreme example where China and India fight a Himalayan skirmish that really disturbs India and damages India relations just when Russia is talking a lot about, as its essence of the GEP, the China-Russia-India triangle. Uh, well, what kind of triangle do they have if China and India are increasingly at odds? And so what is Russia going to do in these circumstances where it's being outmaneuvered, China is gaining more influence, there are a whole series of problems in this relationship, even though at the top, they insist that it's stronger than ever. It's really going forward. There's even potential to create an alliance. They both don't like the United States. After the North Korean diplomacy fiasco ends, uh, both of them pick up the pieces with stronger ties to North Korea, a more hostility to the US approach to the <clears throat> Korean Peninsula. And so what's gonna happen next? And I think the Ukraine war is the option that Russia chooses to try to not only accomplish certain goals in, in Europe, but to accomplish the goal of proving to China that it is a great power. Uh, it belongs in the top grand strategic triangle. It, it, it will defeat Ukraine quickly and establish itself as the main direct opponent of the West and China will embrace Russia on those terms um, and so on. Now, I also want to say uh, just briefly before we go on to the other speakers, and you'll have plenty of time to ask any follow up you want, that there are five dimensions to Sino Russian relations that I have been dealing with the global geopolitics, global geoeconomics, gaps in national identities, the Eurasian regional architecture thinking, and direct bilateral interconnections. And if I think if you do take a scorecard of these spies and how they strengthen, you see a kind of sequence. 
and that China and Russia get over their major barriers on each of these five dimensions over a period of five or more years. So at the beginning of the 2020s, they are closer on at least on, on, on the basics of these, even though there are lots of uh, uh, specific <laughs> problems. So that I would argue that national identity gaps will overcome first. I wrote a book that came out in 2014, 15, uh, on uh, the overlapping uh, identities of the two. Then there were some stopgap measures to deal with their differing regional architecture. It goes on for a while, for at least a few more years. Then there's a question of whether China will agree with Russia on global geoeconomics and the Trump's trade war helps push China. Russia's delighted with the trade war, that trade war because Russia sees China moving sharply against the United States. Uh, and then the priority of geopolitics can trump everything else under these new circumstances, despite some troubled bilateral interconnections. So I say relations solidified before 2020. They passed a vital test in 2022. They still got a lot of problems, and one of the, some of those problems helped lead Russia to turn west in order to position itself better in the east. I'll stop right there, and we'll go to Gaia. Oh, thank you, Gail. Um, so my uh, chapter talks about a shift um, in the balance of power between China and Russia and Central Asia. And um, if we go back, to China's introducing the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, there was a formula created by the Chinese. China would take the leadership in economics. Russia would take the leadership in security. And so that's been the traditional way in which they tried to establish their leadership. Um, with regard to Central Asia, there's three narratives. There's the Chinese narrative, the Russian narrative, and the Central Asian narrative. And most of us here in the West hear the Chinese and the Russian, but we don't really hear the Central Asian very much. Um, by 2021, uh, China is starting to press Kazakhstan in particular. I do focus on Kazakhstan in my uh, chapter because Kazakhstan is the largest, it's very active in diplomacy, and uh, there's a lot more written on it. Um, it starts trying to press Kazakhstan to realign their um, policies with Chinese policies to be more cooperative. Uh, in January 2022, I think China was starting to feel that it was probably on an equal footing with Russia, even though if it was doing economics, Russia's doing security. And then there is this uprising in um, Kazakhstan and Tukayev, the president, calls on Putin to send peacekeepers. And this is a shock to the Chinese because the Chinese are completely cut out of it. They, they have no function in this peacekeeping effort, no security function. And some Russian analysts afterwards kind of gloat and in their articles writing about it, that Russia has demonstrated that its role in security is dominant and China really had no role in that at all. And after that, we start to see China develop um, a greater, greater security role. And they do that in two regional conferences. One is the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and the other is called SICA. What does SICA stand for? Um, I don't know. They just call it SICA. So, um, so at one level, uh, China and Russia, before the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, are trying to coordinate their leadership position um, in Central Asia. But um, Putin is treated very badly at the SCO. He's not greeted by the Uzbek president. He's kept waiting. You know, traditionally Putin kept other people waiting. He's kept waiting over and over again by uh, leaders in Central Asia. And so all in all, he goes away from the SCO meeting looking not very powerful at all. And whatever initiative that he tried to organized with China, it doesn't get 
published. It doesn't get discussed. And um, so the next meeting then is SICA. Oh, and I should mention the Central Asian countries issued the Samarkand um, Declaration. And the declaration says that Central Asian countries are the core of the SCO. And so they kind of ignore the fact that China and Russia are the leaders of Central Asia in their declaration completely. And I believe that's also when China introduces its global security initiative. And so the global security initiative, according to Xi Jinping, um, is kind of a framework that is meant to suck in a lot of other regional organizations like the SCO, the C uh, CICA, CICA, um, the China Central Asian five plus one. And um, Xi Jinping is basically trying to create a political framework for the Belt and Road Initiative. And th this is in relation to Beijing not being able to get better coordination from the Central Asian countries. So he, he's hoping to create a political framework for the BRI and the Global Security Initiative would be part of it, but he's also hoping to co-opt existing political organizations like the SCO and SICA. So 2022, uh, I think, it's really the year where you see a great deal of effort on the part of China in response to January 2022, trying to establish its security role. And um, Russia coming up with initiatives and having them basically ignored. At the SICA meeting, I believe Putin tried to go to one of his favorite conspiracy theories about the West, very critical of the West, anti-West but not really getting much traction and basically Central Asia ignoring that because most of the Central Asian countries are not anti-Western. China and Russia are trying to create a Eurasian order that's anti-Western, but the, the, the uh, middle powers are not really interested in that. So 2022, so it's basically SCO and SICA. Throughout 2023, we see various efforts on the part of China to uh, create that security role and to create the political framework. But there's some problems with the Chinese assumptions. <clears throat> One assumption is that China assumed there would be de-Russification of Central Asia, that if China is anti-Western, they assumed Central Asia would be anti-Western. And so if, if Russification is European, then the Central Asians would be very happy to overthrow that. But that's not the case at all. And so China approached Central Asia on the basis of um, Asian-ness, but it didn't resonate very well with Central Asians, although we call them Central Asians. Um, they follow a multi-vector diplomacy. So they're reaching out in every which direction. Uh, 2023 really opened my eyes. I attended the Astana International Forum. And there <clears throat> we saw basically Tokaya, he had organized this forum. We see hundreds of people, there's a thousand people there, including me, um, from Europe and the Middle East. And there wasn't much of a Chinese presence and there wasn't much of a Russian presence. And we certainly didn't see them taking a leadership position. There was no indications of Chinese leadership or Russian leadership at all. Uh, so in this, within the space of the Austin Inter International Forum, this was the multi-vector diplomacy that President Tukaya and Kazakhstan as a whole wanted to follow. This, I think, has created some difficulties in China-Russia relations, although, you know, publicly they always maintain a, a happy facade. I think there was also the China-Central Asia summit, 
which is an effort at building institutions. So the um, addressing the um, political framework issue. And again, wanting to incorporate all the regional organizations into it. So by the end of 2023, um, the Chinese uh, ambassador to Russia suggests that they need to coordinate better on security issues. And basically he's asking that Russia acknowledge that China has a security role, that China has a security identity in Central Asia. And China had been working on that throughout 2022 and 2023. And um, I don't know what the Russian response was immediately in December, but in the meantime, um, China was working on some of the Central Asian countries. And I think the sequence is very important. So um, in January, 2024, there was an SCO rats meeting, and this is uh, a security meeting related to terrorism and China raised security cooperation. Then in March 29th, uh, Kazakhstan and China met for the first strategic dialogue and they had they agreed to establish a mechanism, a strategic dialogue mechanism. And this was a meeting of foreign ministers. So basically this was Kazakhstan recognizing China's security identity. And I should mention that in February, there was a um, SCO meeting, not the big annual meeting, but there's a lot of working groups. So in February, there was a meeting where Beijing promoted security coordination also. And then in early April, the Chinese uh, Minister of State Security visited Uzbekistan and he got Uzbekistan to recognize China's security identity, but focusing on police, which is more of a low level way of uh, co cooperating with security. Um, and April 3rd, Tokayev at an SCO meeting called for a uh, a security response mechanism. So, so China and 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 obviously Kazakhstan is cooperating with China on this, creating a security identity for for um, China. The response then is after having met with all these Central Asian countries and talked about China's security role. On April 9th, the foreign ministers of Russia and China met. And they agreed to start a dialogue on cooperation, creating a Eurasian security order. And they agreed to deepen their security cooperation. The purpose, of course, is very anti-Western, um, but it was also to adapt to China's security role. So that only was, that was less than a week ago that that happened. Um, so the old formula of China taking leadership in economics and Russia taking leadership in security now, I believe has changed. And now Moscow has agreed that yes, China has a security role. I don't know if it's equal to Russia, but it, I think I think Moscow had to respond to the sequence of meetings that China maneuvered in with Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan. Those are the two most important Central Asian two largest uh, Central Asian countries. And so, so anyway, the old division of labor is gone, I think. And, um, but Xi Jinping has not really created a political framework for the Belt and Road Initiative. The political framework would allow for more discussions of politics and security. And he hasn't done that yet regional organizations have not been willing to be incorporated into um, the global security initiative. And I should mention in 2018, he had also tried to pull the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization into the Belt and Road Initiative. And that was vetoed by India at a Shanghai SCO meeting. So um, anyway, I think I'll stop there.
Let me let me just add one thing. Uh, Gaia has just written a chapter on the Chinese thinking about Central Asia. I have been writing on the Chinese thinking, and both of us are have a tendency to stray from just talking about what the book says on Russian thinking, based as I'm saying, especially on Russian sources and others, although we do use Chinese and Central Asian sources in her case. Uh, and so you can see that everything is connected and it's very difficult to talk about some of these issues like Central Asia without giving heavy weight to what China is saying and as well as what Russia is saying and whether they're able to work together very closely. James. Okay, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be here. So thank you very much. Uh, for accommodating me. So uh, my chapter of the book um, is uh, Russia's turn to the east or Russia turns to the east yet away from Japan. And within that chapter, I focus on Russian policy over an entire decade uh, towards Japan. But in my comments just now, I'm going to focus on something a bit narrower. And I'm going to address just the narrow security perspective, and in particular, the question of what threat does Russia pose to Japanese security? And then if you have questions about broader aspects of Russia-Japan relations, I'll be very happy to answer them later on. Okay, so on that question of the potential Russian threat, at first glance, you would think that there's every reason to think that Russia does pose a direct military threat to Japan. If you look at Russian military capabilities, the closest significant Russian military forces are just 25 kilometers away from Hokkaido. That's the Russian forces based on the southern Kuril Islands, specifically on Kunashiri. And in recent years, they've been upgraded. In 2016, you had new anti-ship missiles being deployed on the islands, the Baal and the Bastion uh, missiles. Also, more recently, S-300 V-4 anti-aircraft um, systems, and also new battle tanks, the uh, T-80BV main battle tanks uh, deployed on the islands. Further to that, you have significant Russian military activity in the vicinity of Japan. Um, just from week to week, there are things which can be mentioned. I'll just choose two very recent examples. On the 2nd of April, you had a pair of uh, Tu-95 Russian strategic bombers uh, carrying out, according to Japanese media, a mock bombing run against the Noto Hanto, uh, the Noto Peninsula, uh, seemingly in very bad taste, given the recent uh, earthquake uh, disaster there. And then also from late March into early April, you had a Russian Vishnya um, class intelligence gathering ship active down the Japanese coastline. So you've got the capabilities, you've got the military activity, and that's combined with quite aggressive rhetoric from Russian officials as well, um, listing Japan as an unfriendly country. Uh, part of the collective West, uh, which is, um, in the Russian view, supporting the so-called Nazi regime in Ukraine. Added to that, you have the Russian embassy in Tokyo uh, putting out statements saying that Japan is supporting a Nazi regime for the second time in less than a century, um, presenting Japan's upgrade of its military, as being, or self-defense forces, as being offensive potential. And then uh, Deputy uh, Chair of the Security Council, former President Dmitry Medvedev, uh, regularly coming out with slightly kind of deranged statements calling for um, Prime Minister Kishida to commit seppuku, ritual suicide. Okay, so you've got both the, the capabilities and seemingly very belligerent rhetoric. And yet, on the Japanese side, there's the view that Russia does not pose a direct pressing military threat. Instead, within the national security strategy, the updated one published at the end of 2022, you have Japan making a clear geographical differentiation when it comes to Russia, 
stating that Russia is a direct threat in the European region, and yet in the Indo-Pacific, clearly including Japan, it is instead categorized as being simply a strong security concern. So very much putting Russia in a different category from North Korea and China. So on this, is Japan being naive? Does it simply not recognize the, the scale of the Russian threat? I would say no. I'd say, in fact, Japan has got this correct, that Russia does not pose a direct threat to Japan itself. And the reason for this is if you look at those capabilities that have been upgraded, if you look at the type of military capabilities, it's pretty clear that their purpose is for anti-access area denial for the Sea of Okhotsk, which is especially important for Russian uh, nuclear submarines. You also have to factor in why would Russia seek to carry out some military provocation directly against Japan? Russia is certainly an aggressive actor but not indiscriminately so. And it's just simply not the reasons for Russia to carry out uh, military action against Hokkaido. But that's clearly not to say that Russia does not pose concerns. It does. And so in the remainder of my comments, I'm going to highlight the ways in which Russia does pose significant security concerns for Japan. And this could be taken in a number of ways. One way is the concern for Japan that Russia acts as a norm destroyer, undermining the international norm of not changing the status quo by force. That's certainly one way that Japan's government is worried about Russia. There are others as well, including the non-conventional threats that Russia poses in terms of cyber, in terms of information conflict, in terms of espionage as well. And I'm happy to talk about those more later. But instead, I think the main thing for Japan as a serious security concern is Russia's role as an accomplice. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Russia is placed in a different category by Japan as a concern rather than a threat. But Japan very much does consider, first of all, China, and then secondary, North Korea, as being threats. And so when Japanese security experts look at Russia, their main worry is how Russia can be an accomplice to China and North Korea. So to take China, first of all, from the Japanese point of view, there's a real worry about the way in which Russia can uh, assist and multiply, potentially, uh, China's capabilities. And striking for Japan, then, is the joint air patrols that were begun in 2019 by the, the Chinese and Russian Air Force, their strategic bombers carrying out regular patrols in the vicinity of uh, Japan. You also have uh, circuits of the Japanese archipelago that are carried out by uh, joint flotillas of the uh, People's Liberation Army Navy and also the Pacific Fleet. Now, from the point of view of Japan, one of their main concerns is, of course, a Taiwan contingency. And uh, Kishida says repeatedly that Ukraine today could be East Asia tomorrow. And clearly that's a reference to a Taiwan contingency. And so that leads many in Japan to worry about what Russia's role could be if there is uh, conflict over Taiwan. Now, from the point of view of Moscow, I think there is no uh, eagerness to be directly involved. But what is of interest is to what extent would Russia find its hand forced? As the relationship between Russia and China becomes more unequal, if China wants Russia to play some sort of supporting role, whether that is 
for instance, through diversionary activities or something else, perhaps Moscow might find that it's difficult to say no. So if we look at that potential point, one thing of potential focus to give us some idea of what Russia kind of might do, well, it's instructive to look at the February uh, 2022 joint statement. Um, you see within that mutual support for core interests. We have also Russia's uh, regular um, support for one China policy uh, after the elections in Taiwan. You had uh, the Russian side once again reiterating its opposition to any form of independence for Taiwan. Um, comments made so vociferously by the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs that it led Taiwan to issue a statement in uh, response, uh, criticizing Russia's involvement in the issue. You also have, interestingly, some comments that were made by Putin during the, the visit by then Chinese Defense Minister Li Shangfu in April 2023, uh, when the Chinese Defense Minister was in Moscow, you had Putin stating that the Pacific fleet could be used in conflict in any direction. So all of this is making sort of um, analysts, politicians within Tokyo really quite nervous. OK, so this is one area of concern and accomplice to China. The other one is Russia's potential role as an accomplice to North Korea. And I think here what you see in a lot of comments from Western officials is worries about how North Korea can assist Russia in the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, within Tokyo, however, I think the worry is, you know, more the other way round, a more worry about what Russia can do for North Korea. And these worries became more heightened after um, Kim's visit to the Russian Far East in September, especially because deliberately the Russian side seemed to design the visit in order to magnify the concerns of those who are worried about Russia helping North Korea with its military. The visit to the Vostochny spaceport was clearly intended to raise concerns about Russia cooperating with North Korea's missile program. Likewise, the visit to the aircraft plant in Komsomolsk, and then you also had those pictures of Kim Jong-un uh, alongside a Kinjal hypersonic missile. Now, this is not accidental. The Russian side's clearly sending a message. You know, if you place pressure upon us, well, perhaps we will cooperate more with North Korea in these particularly sensitive areas. Subsequent to that, in November, you had the successful launch of North Korea's first spy satellite, Lots of interest, lots of debate about the extent to which North, uh, sorry, Russia might have assisted with that. And then more recently, too, in March, you had Russia using the veto in the UN Security Council in order to prevent the extension of the, the monitoring panel for um, sanctions on, on North Korea. So all of this is suggesting that Russia is willing to play something of an accomplice role for North Korea and worrying, too, in Tokyo, the possibility of it having an emboldening, emboldening effect on North Korea. A North Korea that in the past might have felt very much isolated now feels that it has the diplomatic and potentially aspects of military support from Moscow. OK, so all of this is really feeding into uh, significant concerns within Tokyo, even though, as I mentioned, Russia is not seen as a direct military threat. So to finish my initial comments, what to do about this from Japan's point of view? So we've had very different approaches. Under Abe from 2012 until 2020, the the concerns were essentially the same. Yes, there was the desire from Abe to make progress on the territorial issue, but actually lying beneath this was very much the strategic rationale. 
we're facing major threats from China and North Korea. We want to make sure that Russia is not cooperating too closely with them. So if we build closer relations with Russia, we can try and neutralize that threat of a united front between Russia and China and North Korea. So was Abe's approach. Obviously, it did not succeed. Kishida's approach has been very different. Yes, there is a lot of sympathy for Ukraine, but Japan's tough approach towards Russia has also been guided by its own security interests and what you might phrase as deterrence by example, trying to ensure that Russia cannot succeed in Ukraine in order to send a message to China that they should not attempt something similar within the region. But at the same time, even though the Kishida administration deserves much praise for its tough stance on Russia, that has limits. Because Japan does not see Russia as a direct military threat and just a security concern, that means that whilst taking that overall tough approach, Tokyo is still interested in maintaining a greater level of dialogue and cooperation with Moscow than is the case with most NATO members. So whilst maintaining these sanctions, this support for Ukraine, the Japanese government is still keeping some areas of cooperation open, including keeping a position of Minister for Economic Cooperation with Russia within the cabinet, not cutting imports of liquefied natural gas, and not having any intention to cut, and also seeking talks at a deputy foreign ministerial level with the Russians. The reason why those haven't taken place is because the Russian side has declined to do so uh, whilst uh, unless there is more compromise from Japan. And another uh, thing this year is that the Japanese government has announced its intention to restart cultural and educational exchange with Russia. Uh, including with uh, the start of a Russian government-sponsored festival of Russian culture, which is beginning in Japan on the 22nd of this month. So my final point is that Japan's approach to Russia is not naive. I think there are very good grounds for Japan taking the view that Russia is not a direct threat and yet does represent a concern as this accomplice role. And so overall, we see Japan taking approach that has much in common with its NATO partners, but at the same time having some differences. And I'll finish my comments there. Before the question and answer, I'm just going to float this around the room so that the people online can hear. So do you want to fill your own questions or do you want me to? We'll fill them on ourselves. Okay. okay. Direct them to a particular person. We'll respond if you are to. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Ayumi. Uh, I'm a postdoc fellow at Weatherhead East Asian Institute. Um, thank you so much for your remarks. Um, I think my questions goes to perhaps Professor Brown and also Professor Gilman. Uh, sorry, Ross Gilman, right? Ross Gilman, uh, uh, Gil Rosman, sorry. Um, my question is more about what Russia is trying to achieve with Japan uh, and with North Korea and China in the Far Eastern area. Um, so Professor Brown talked a lot about what Japan is seeing Russia to be, what kind of threats or security concerns they have. I think I don't still get what Russia's grand strategy is in that corner of the region? Um, is it just kind of taking, peel, peeling away US allies away from the United States? Are they just being opportunistic and getting, you know, trying to play different cards so that they have more hedging uh, opportunities in the future? Um, do they want to be involved in the Taiwan contingency? Uh, what are their calculations with North Korea in, you know, buying ammunitions from North Korea, being somewhat more dependent on North Korea and then boarding North Korea in some ways. Um, 
are they just being a spoiler? Uh, do they have any strategic ends uh, in coherent ways? Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for, for your question. So I think in terms of, of what the, the Russian side ultimately would like to achieve, it's the same as it's always been, which is the long-term goal of Japan becoming a neutral country, or at least more of a neutral country rather than such a reliable ally of the United States. Now, they are not completely delusional. They recognize that that's not on the cards. But I think the Moscow's approach is that that's the end goal. And anything that they can do to try and um, move even a small distance towards them by exploiting frictions between Japan and the United States, by cultivating those within Japan who do have a more skeptical view towards the US alliance, that's the, the overall goal. And I think that part of the Russian thinking that also feeds into this is the, the view that they've, all, they've convinced themselves that Japan is just a vassal of the United States. And that when Japan does things like impose sanctions on Russia, it is not really Japan's free will. It is simply Japan's arm being twisted behind its back. And so given that that's the view, there's always the belief that there's a chance for uh, Japan to move towards a more independent position because they believe that Japan is being forced against its will. So the, if that pressure is ever reduced, then Japan will more freely be able to choose a more independent position. Now, I think this is fundamentally uh, wrong. I think it's a real misunderstanding of the great enthusiasm for the US alliance within Japan. And um, this idea of Japan being a vassal kind of state um, really speaks to the way in which I think many Russian decision makers don't really understand how US-led alliances operate and um, you know, believe that US-led alliances are more like the relationship that Russia sometimes has with its own security partners, where it is much more of an unbalanced relationship. I'm going to add to that. Um, over the course of the decade, Japanese assumed certain things about Russia in Abe's initiative. I'd call them Abe's illusions. And the foreign ministry in Japan often did not accept. Abe went out through the Kante, went around the foreign ministry for his Russia initiatives because there was better understanding that this was not reciprocated. Japan talked about real hopes for the Northern Territories, Russia never showed any interest. There was no discussion of any possibility. And before long, Russia was saying it's an impossibility. Japan talked about finding some common thinking. Russia was saying increasingly, history is about 1945. Japan has to recognize that Russia is the victor. Japan is a loser. Japan has no right to do anything but recognize what happened in 1945 as the, the outcome that all have to assume is the starting point. Uh, economic relations really didn't go very far. Japan never found that Russia wanted to balance China, but like some in the United States, there was this notion some kind of wedge can be driven between Russia and China, even though increasingly it became unlikely. So I think that Russia's hope, just keeping this going, keeping Abe's illusion alive, was more about after the Crimean War, showing that the West was not united, showing that trying to create trouble because Obama didn't like what Japan was doing with Russia for a while. Trump didn't seem to care about it at all. Um, so this was really a uh, an increasingly anti-West approach where Japan 
lost any relevance to Russia, but Japan took a few years to figure that out. Since I have the mic, I'm going to ask some questions. Uh, Liz Wishnick, uh, Weatherhead East Asian Institute. So I have three questions. This is really interesting, and I look forward to reading more of the book in, in the future. Uh, one question on Japan, since we were talking about it, is a, uh, you mentioned that Japan is continuing to purchase LNG from Russia. Can you say something about uh, Jap Japan's attitude towards investment in the Russian energy sector in the Russian Far East and in the Arctic? Um, North Korea came up a few times. And um, is there um, a Russia-China-North Korea axis forming? We, see, we hear this sometimes in the United States, uh, uh, looking at the deepening China-Russia relationship and Russia's um, uh, growing cooperation with North Korea. Do we look at these two trends and see an axis, or are there differences among Russia and China about uh, North Korea? I'm asking you this because I have to talk about this tomorrow, so I'm hoping to get some tips. And then finally, um, for Gaia, I'm interested in, in how you see China assessing the, the regional integration that's going on in Central Asia. You mentioned the Samarkand Declaration. So do you, do you think, think China sees this as a welcome development or one that's going to be uh, raise the barrier to its uh, interests in expanding its role in the region? Thank you. You want to go first? Yeah, so thank you very much. So maybe a little bit of, of background on the energy issue, first of all. So um, Japan has involvement in two LNG projects within Russia, the Sakhalin 2 project, which is Mitsubishi and Mitsui, uh, holding uh, collectively 22.5% uh, of the, the project, and then the Arctic LNG 2 project, which is a 10% stake held jointly by Jokmek and um, Mitsui. And uh, with the Sakhalin 2 project, which is long been operating, that is continuing to provide LNG to Japan. Uh, that accounts for around 9% of Japan's energy imports. With the Arctic LNG 2 project, that is only now beginning. It was beginning of this year, end of last year, that it first started to produce uh, LNG. But that is under um, Treasury, U.S. Treasury sanctions. And so that's essentially frozen. And so it can't go forward. So the U.S. Treasury drew a contrast between the two projects, taking the view, well, cycle in two, it's been operating for a long time. You're already importing that energy. Fair enough you can continue to rely on it. Arctic LNG 2, because it's new imports, US Treasury said, well, you've been surviving until now without it. We don't need this additional uh, energy. Okay, so that's the, the broad overview. Uh, within Japan, the view has been that um, that 9% is too important to do without. And so the Japanese government has drawn a very clear line between different energy sources. They have almost completely stopped importing Russian oil. Most months it's zero. Sometimes there's a very small amount, but it's basically down to zero. Coal, they're on track to completely eliminate imports of Russian coal. So Japan has significantly reduced its energy imports from Russia but only in those other areas. And within LNG, it's just been judged to be kind of too important. And the argument made principally by the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, who are those that most focus on energy security, is that um, there's such demand for LNG internationally that it would be difficult for Japan to replace that Russian LNG. Now, of course they could, but it would come at a cost. The second argument made by Messi is that actually, by holding on to those long-term contracts, they are in a way supporting the sanctions regime. Because if they walked away from those long-term contracts for suckling to gas, Russia would be able to resell that gas 
on the spot market and make more money from it, or they would be able to give those long-term contracts to China, which would be then beneficial to, to China. And so that's the argument from the, from the Japanese side. Uh, coming back to Arctic LNG2, just for a moment, that was very interesting because it seemed that in Tokyo, they simply got that wrong. They believed that they were going to be able to import gas from that project. Um, they seem to have been taken rather by surprise when towards the end of last year, the US Treasury sanctioned the project. And I think that was a bit surprising. It's so obvious, I felt, that um, the US was strongly against that project. So it seems like there was a little bit of miscommunication there between Washington and Tokyo. I want to add something. Uh, Japan and Europe both are importing a good deal of LNG or gas pipelines, actually, in Europe. So the U.S. has been more concerned about disrupting the energy market uh, than some other issues relating to Russia. Uh, so that hasn't been a real strain in the relationship. Uh, actually, METI and the U.S., uh, Commerce Department have been working extremely closely together. Uh, and so things like export controls, even though there, there's some, James says something about a little bit of a difference between Japan and the United States and how to approach Russia. I don't think there's any partner of the United States closer than Japan is in terms of working on the main areas of how to punish Russia and how to keep mm -hmm. Russia from building up its its military ties. As for the question, Liz's question about um, the Sino-Russian North Korean axis, the paper that you need to read comes out next month by Sid Seiler, a leading specialist on North Korea who just left the intelligence community. And uh, he's written a detailed analysis of the coming out in Korea policy that you'll want to see. But at the same time, um, it appears that uh, uh, China is a little bit less eager and a little bit more concerned about Russia-North Korea relations. Uh, although the Chinese number three uh, this week is in North Korea. Uh, and it's clear that uh, on the whole, this triangle is moving forward. I sort of specialize in talking about triangles in East Asia, and uh, I regard this triangle as very significant and advancing, but uh, not to the point where it looks like an alliance at this right now. Um, so Chinese views on this situation. Um, well, as Kazakhstan, practices multi-vector diplomacy with Europe, Middle East, India, Turkey, United States. Uh, the Chinese are very negative on that. It, you'll see a lot of articles written by Chinese analysts about what to do about this multi-vector diplomacy because it's undermining China's effort to have a leadership role and create a sphere of influence. They were expecting the Belt and Road Initiative would, would do that, and yet it doesn't have that political framework. And they can't seem to create a political framework either, although they've tried over and over again since 2018. Um, so I think China views, well, Central Asia views Russia as failing its security responsibilities in Central Asia after February, 2022. And therefore, if something needs to fill that gap, and China looks at it that way also. So China and Central Asia agree that Russia is not fulfilling its security role. And so I think that's the basis for their cooperation and Central Asia basically helping China uh, establish itself as a security player. And China, of course, is looking at, at it as a strategic opportunity. And you know, when Chinese say strategic opportunity, that means, um, this is their chance to move in where Russia is just simply failing. So with regard to regional organizations, the question has been for Chinese how to co-opt 
that regional organization, how to pull that organization into the larger political framework that nobody is accepting. So that was basically what's happening. The bigger question here is to what extent is China infringing on Russian interests by taking advantage of the increasing asymmetry resulting from Russia's uh, problems in Ukraine. So is China able to or willing to? And uh, we haven't seen any Russian discussion of this problem. It seems to be beyond what censors will permit. Um, but uh, nervousness, indirect references. But I would wonder, maybe Gaia has a comment uh, the opening up of Vladivostok as a port where at last the Russian Northeast, Heilongjiang and Jilin, can begin exporting their products to other parts of China primarily through Russia rather than having to go all the way down the peninsula to Dalian is an indication that something the Russians wanted for decades finally is coming about. What does that mean? Something that the Chinese wanted. Something the Chinese had wanted for decades and Russia had been blocking it. The Chinese also wanted North Korea to open up because both ways would have been an exit for China to the uh, Sea of Japan. But in fact, uh, they had trouble doing it. And now China seems to be getting something of what it wanted. Right. Well, I, I don't see it as a surprise that yeah. China has access to Vladivostok because they've been talking about these high-speed rail lines uh, that would go to uh, Vladivostok for a really long time. And they've made these regional plans about between uh, Dungbei and the Russian Far East, and they've had several of those plans. And that always included uh, the rail line. So the rail line obviously had to end up in Vladivostok. Um, but I think uh, the big surprise is Russia acquiescing to China's security role in Central Asia. I would have, they didn't say very much about it, and yet they did have a meeting between foreign ministers, and they did accept that China had a security role. And then after January 2022, uh, Russian analysts basically would not accept that. They were just emphasizing that Russia had a security role in Central Asia. So something in the space of two years changed. Maureen Berman, I'm a graduate of SEPA. Thank you for your very illuminating comments, panelists, and congratulations on the book. I have a question for Professor Rosman. You opened your remarks by saying, if not for the move to the East, then there would not have been an invasion of Ukraine. Could you talk a little bit more about that? And the second part of the question is, if there are elements of making statements to the East and to the West, was one more important in Russia making the decision to invade Ukraine? Second part is tough, you know, choosing what factors matter more. But I put it this way. One is the Russian economy was extremely dependent on Europe until this turn to the East. And gradually they became less dependent, less dependent on the dollar as they began currency swaps with, with China, less um, changing the mindset of thinking about Russia as part of the European community, the old expression of Gorbachev. So I think that that is one thing. They sort of created a foundation where they could move. Another factor, uh, which I touched on before, is the nervousness about what was the nature of the Sino-Russian relationship. Gradually, it was shifting, becoming more asymmetrical. Uh, Russia had very little to sell to China except its oil and gas. They were becoming more and more dependent on consumer goods from China, industrial goods from China. They, China was ignoring Russian interests, as I mentioned in India, as we see to some degree in Central Asia. Um, what could Russia do to regain China's respect to be taken as part of the big triangle with the United States rather than as a secondary actor 
where China could pretty much do what it wanted over time, although it's been careful over the last 25 years to defer symbolically to Russia in various ways, not to play the wolf warrior rhetoric card with Russia the way it does, has with you know, various countries like Australia. So I think that what happened is that without saying so, Putin searched for a way to gain a more leverage with China and a position where he could boost Russian identity as a Eurasian country. The Eurasian Economic Union has a few small countries in Russia um, and Kazakhstan. Could it get Ukraine? Putin very much wants Ukraine in that union. And then it can say, Eurasia is a big deal. And Eurasian identity really matters rather than China's identity is so overpowering. Russia really doesn't have a meaningful say in Asia. So I think that's the other factor. One quick follow up. Yeah. Do we have any sense of how China is responding given the way the war has been going in Ukraine? Has Putin's strategy proved to be elusive? Um, I think and maybe others want to respond to this, too, because I think that's a big question. Um, I think China has responded in ways that are not totally satisfactory to Russia, but generally supportive. So if you go to point one, what is the cause of the war? China's explanation is its NATO expansion, its US desire for hegemony, their explanation overlaps with Russia's explanation and overlaps with their discussions in Asia. So that is supporting Russia in a major way. Uh, second, how should the war end? Although China says it's neutral and it keeps some dialogue with Russia, uh, there's no indication that China wants the war to end with Russia as anything but successful. How successful is the question, but Russia should come out of this as a strengthened power rather than a weakened power. It wants a serious Russia anti-America outcome from this. Uh, and it's not displeased that Russia's cut off ties with Europe significantly and is much more dependent on China. So I think there's a, China's lost some. I mean, it's uh, it, Japan, South Korea, other countries have turned much more worried about China than they were beforehand. Uh, Russia's isolation uh, from the West makes it a, a, a less able to maneuver. So there is some problems. I wrote at one point that I think China had lost a lot in 2023 from the war in Ukraine. But I think on the whole, China sees um, Russia's improved position now as a plus for China and still is seeking uh, um, to come out of this with a very strong Sino-Russian relationship, not to blame Russia at all for what's going on and to, um, uh, and to try to take advantage of the outcome by maybe strengthening ties with Ukraine at the end. Definitely. Oh, you want to go ahead. Rob. Thank you. I have a question ready to all the speakers. Um, China's population is not increasing anymore, uh, but it still is vastly more populated than Russia, whose population is also decreasing, uh, and the Russian Far East is empty. Is there in the mind of Russian policymakers a concern that there are hundreds of millions of Chinese on one side of the border, on the other side, there are territories that were more or less part of the historical Chinese empire. Is there some concern about the fact that in the same way as the Russian concept of the Ukrainian-Russian border is flexible, that maybe the Chinese conception of the Russian border is flexible in ways that are not necessarily favorable to Russia? This is an argument that was widely circulated in Russia mm -hmm. in the 1990s. And China compromised with the territorial demarcation. And they said, this issue is solved. 
Russian and Chinese leaders have both said, we don't have that problem. But if you ask me, in the background, mm. is there nervousness? Not so much Chinese migration. Yeah, uh, Chinese have a higher standard of living right now than the mm. Russian parties. But more about, um, will China bring up the historical territorial mm. dispute again mm. with you know maps, historical maps that they mm. still circulate? And will that put pressure on Russia and alter the relationship. If Russia oversteps its bounds, this is something China could draw on. But there's no sign that that's happening at this point. Okay. I know, I know it's been resolved. I also know that the map making, reach, finding all maps is a very profitable business in East Asia. Yeah. <laughs> keep all of this issue yeah. alive. And Russians are not allowed into these Chinese museums. Uh, thank you so much. Um, learned a lot. I have two questions. Um, one is to understand a little bit more about how Russia's policies towards North Korea changed in its turn to the east and to what extent that fluctuated given the diplomacy under Trump as well as um, sort of the aftermath or as is getting more cooperation with North Korea after the its invasion of Ukraine. Um, and I guess, especially directed to Professor Brown, I was curious, what exactly is the nature of Japan's concerns about North Korea's emboldenment? Is it more about a persisting nuclear program? Is there concern about additional military action? Like to what extent, you know, what, what exactly are, are those concerns? Um, and my second question is more around um, this really interesting observation around how China has traditionally been the economic provider um, rather than a security provider. And I think we can see that's the case not just in Central Asia, but in Northeast Asia, certainly with U.S. allies and Southeast Asia, where you know surveys consistently show you know, people favor economic ties with China, but would rely or trust the U.S. more on security issues, especially with the South China Sea. I think even in South Asia with Pakistan, you could even say there's maybe this sort of a divide with the U.S. As so I'm curious, would you say this shifting dynamic in Central Asia is something that we can expect China to attempt in other parts of Asia as part of the global security initiative? Or is that more difficult given the counterpart is the U.S. rather than Russia and some of these other subregions. Thank you. I'll start on the North Korea issue, Russia and North Korea. I had a research project in 2003 to 5 on uh, the uh, Russian thinking about North Korea, Korean Peninsula. And I came away with the view we had the Bush's language that's five versus one in the six party talks was nonsense. <laughs> Russia wanted North Korea to come out of this uh, in a more substantial way, and they didn't. They blamed the U.S. for the pressure we were putting on. And so, when the Chonan incident occurred in 2010, Russia joined China and not blaming North Korea for sinking the the South Korean uh, vessel. Um, I would say that in the period when Kim Jong Un took power, uh, Russia was more interested in boosting relations with North Korea than China was. China was waiting for Kim Jong-un to recognize uh, China's position, and he didn't do so. And he, of course, killed the uh, uncle of um, his uncle, and in, in who was very involved in China relations. Uh, so that I was saying through 2016, there was a Russian initiative to North Korea that went beyond China's initiative. In 2017, Russia felt under great pressure when the, um, the Security Council resolutions came forward and Russia did not want to go along with China's position, but it was pressed by China and it agreed. But as soon as the, the, the diplomacy began under Trump, Russia was saying, we want, to be involved with North Korea. They waited a little while, they got Kim Jong-un to visit Russia in 2019, and ever since, they've had a, a big stake. And now with the Ukraine war, they're even more interested in making North Korea a big part of its turn. After all, if they're trying to avoid total asymmetry with China, North Korea is one of their few options. Yeah, thank you for, for your question. So uh, to do with uh, Japan's specific concerns to do with uh, Russia's assistance to North Korea, I think uh, two main things. First of all, 
uh, a specific technical one to do with missiles. So uh, it's always said that Japan has three main priorities when it comes to, to North Korea. It's the, the Dachi Mondai, the, you know, these issues, missiles, this nuclear program. And I think in Japan is real worry about potential Russian assistance for North Korea's missile program, in particular to do with re-entry vehicle. So there, we know North Korea can, in theory, hit the United States with an ICBM. But there's been a lot of doubt as to whether North Korea can hit the continental United States with an ICBM with a survivable nuclear weapon on it. And that seems to be the final bit of technology that perhaps North Korea does not yet have. And possibly, if Russia was willing to do so, they could assist with that. Now, the reason why that would be so worrying for Japan is that if you can have a North Korea that can definitely hit continental United States with a nuclear weapon, does that destroy extended deterrence? Would a US president really be willing to sacrifice a US city in order to defend allies in East Asia? So that's one area of concern. The other one is just basic North Korean aggression. The, an emboldened North Korea could make a serious strategic mistake in attacking South Korea. Now, it doesn't make any sense for North Korea to do that. However, when it relies on the judgment of just one individual, you cannot rule out that concern. And so uh, that's the added element of Japanese worries. <clears throat> And your question was, um, could it be reproduced? Could it be replicated? What happened in Central Asia? Could it be replicated anywhere else? Well, I think it could be replicated in Southeast Asia because they're both under the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, but there was a power vacuum in Central Asia because Russia just sort of faded away in terms of its security role. There's no real power vacuum in Southeast Asia because the US and Japan are both very active in Southeast Asia economically for Japan and militarily for the US. But um, they, um, so Southeast Asia plays multi-vector diplomacy very similar to South, uh, Central Asia. It's this balancing the major powers. And um, the Chinese have found that very annoying and especially Singapore. And so that came to a head in 2016 when Beijing confronted Singapore and he didn't want it to play a uh, balance of power anymore with different major powers, but rather to uh, fall in line with Beijing's policies. And so Beijing doesn't use Asianness so much with Singapore as Chinese-ness. You know, Xi Jinping has said that ethnic Chinese uh, communities and all the host countries for BRI can be very helpful for facilitating and furthering BRI objectives or China's objectives. Um, but I think there's been a reaction to that in Southeast Asia, but what is it called? Post-Chinese move. Yeah, but I don't know where it would happen. And, and Russia has tried to claim that its greater Eurasian partnership extends all the way to ASEAN in Southeast Asia, but mainly that's just on paper. It doesn't have a reality to it. Yes. I have one question for Professor Kim How much significant uh, is uh, Russia's turn to the East really significant to Russia's strategy? Because um, in, in Russian history, all the debate is, is about whether we are European country or a Slavic country. It's never about whether we are Asian country. So, uh, and if Russia wants to fight a war, it fights the war in Europe, not in Asia. So I was wondering how much significant this turn to the East to uh, Russia's strategic calculation. Thank you. Well, before I forget, I have some copies of the book. I brought some extras, and you can get it at the author's discount price of $30 if you, if you really want it. Um, I think that um, something fundamental has changed. Russia talked about its Asia, Asian vector in the 19th century. Um, it talked about um, 
um, the communist revolutions in the 20th century as uh, bringing Russia together with countries in Asia. Uh, there were other proposals, but this is this is fundamental. It's cut its economic ties dramatically because of the Ukraine war with Europe. There's no talk about it in Russia as Europe anymore. It's that all those other years, it, it was a European country with European culture. It had ballet, it had so much else. It was shared its traditions with Europe. That's not, it's rarely heard anymore in the mainstream in Russia. It's a Eurasian country. It's, it's got a different sphere of influence, a different identity. It's not part of Europe. And by moving into turn to the east, it has been trying to accomplish something so fundamental. That's why I said this isn't Obama's building up of America's maritime presence in, in Asia on the foundation of what existed. This is Russia trying to reorient in a fundamental way Russia's orientation one way or another. And now it's very hard to see how it goes back. Where, unless there's a, a revolution, unless someone totally changes the atmosphere in Russia, this is where it's going to be for a long time to come. And Putin's planning to stay in office for a long time. Questions? Yeah, Jeff. Well, this has actually worked out really well because it's six o'clock. The food is here, and uh, this is when we were originally scheduled to end the session. So, thanks everyone. Give our, our panelists a round of applause. Thank you, Dan. Not, not a problem. This is actually going to be our last public event for the semester. Um, so, thanks everyone for coming, and uh, we'll see you in the fall. <laughs>